want to welcome you here to our board today for our meeting today, defending God's gift of the life. We have today with us, we're so honored and grateful. We have two of the foremost voices. Uh, God is our day, the kingdom of God on the earth today, as it relates to defending the unborn in attorney of Esquire, Max Taylor. And talk about why we give him a great big hand. We will be having a more formal introduction to them um, as we further go further in our program. But I just want to, first of all, welcome our guests um, that are here this morning, this evening. Um, we have on our roster to my left or right is Michelle Secker. Chad, Pastor Chad, Chad Secker, the First Assembly of God Church, Pastor Matt Saber, I mean, Mr. Matt Saber, uh, that's here today with us, he flew all the way from Orlando, Florida, to be with us. We have the Right Reverend Father uh, Philip Infer uh, with us also, Episcopal Vicar for Pastoral Victory. Region 4 Preach Pastors of the Diocese of Pittsburgh. We also have um, with us today um, the Executive Director or Chairman of the uh, People Concern for the Unborn Child, Mrs. Diane Marcella. Let's give her a great big hand. And while I'm introducing her, I want to want all those who are part of the Executive Board to please stay in. I just want to recognize these people. I've been in ministry for some 30 something years. I also um, been pastoring for the last 18 years. I've been on different, many different boards, civic organizations. I have never had to find a more hardworking group of people than I myself and her executive team. Let's give them a great thank Also, uh, Mr. Cole, Vice Chair, Terry Leshy, Claudia Pahlo, Mary Wagner, Joanne Malak, who is the Treasurer and Assistant Treasurer of Beverly Houston. So we thank God for her assistance. And also the Advisory Board Council. If any of those that are here today, which I'm sure you are, will you please stand? We want the board to recognize you, we want the audience to recognize you this morning. And if you're here today, just please stand. Everybody
together in prayer for the unborn child. Lord, I pray that you would, Lord God, bless this evening, bless our hearts. God, may the conviction that we have flow over, Lord God, into those around us, to those in our community, and those, or those in our very state and in our country. Lord, our desire is one day we will see, Lord God, this legislation overturned, and all life, Lord God, will be valued as such, created in the very image of their Creator. God, I pray that you would bless this evening, bless our fellowship, bless God our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and Lord God, our wills to be transformed and even more empowered and made courageous for this great cause through our speakers tonight. God, I pray that, Lord God, you will bless the hands that have prepared the food for us. Lord God, we thank you for the meal we will receive. And God, above all things, Lord, may you be glorified in every way tonight. For God, we give you glory and we give you honor and we give you praise. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, I know I was a bit weird because I wasn't allowed to speak, so I'm super excited to hear the people over here. Well, many of you may know me. My name is Sarah Bowman, and I'm the Executive Director of Alpha Omega Center. Some of you may be more familiar with our old name, which is Pregnancy Resource Center. And in New Castle, we're located right on Jefferson Street Hill, right up from the East At Alpha Omega Center, our mission is to help women who are considering abortion or who are vulnerable to abortion and to give them resources, love, and support so that they can choose life for their unborn children. We do that through pregnancy testing, ultrasound scans, options, education, information, community resources, and most of all, to the love of Christ. Because we know that we are the hands and feet of Christ, and we know that He needs women to where they are, and that He would be there for them, no matter where they are in their lives. In addition to offering those medical services, we help women who are in need of baby items or other material support, and we also work with students in our local schools to educate them about access, health relationships, and saving themselves for marriage. Now that's what we do, and I could probably talk about that a lot longer, but I won't. What I want to talk about, is it working? Are we making a difference? Well, I can tell you that last year, we could point to 24 lives that were saved from abortion because of the work of Alpha Omega. <laughs> and when we think about those 24 lives, it's not just them. It's not just babies, although that would be enough. It's their mothers and their fathers and their grandparents. Many of them had siblings, have siblings. And many of them are our neighbors and our friends. People that we may not even know were experiencing an unsung pregnancy. People that we may not have known were considering abortion came to Alpha Omega Center and had the opportunity to choose life for their children. Even more than that, we know what we do is working because in the state of Pennsylvania, abortion clinics are required to report their numbers to the state. The very first year that we were medical in Lawrence County, that was 2013, we saw abortion numbers drop by 20% in Lawrence County. Now the first year that happened, I pointed that out to a couple of people, and I am an optimist, and a couple of people frankly framed on my parade. So next, next year I brought an umbrella, and I checked the numbers, and they were holding at a 20% drop. So what that means to me is what we're doing is working. 
we're saving lives, we're lowering the abortion rate in Lawrence County, and we're making a difference. But it also says to me that we need to do better. We can do more. Because when we see a mother, when we see mothers who are considering abortion, we see 85% of them change their minds and choose life for their children. 85%. So if we can see every mother who is experiencing an unplanned pregnancy, every mother who is considering abortion, then we can see that number drop by a lot more than 20%. Tonight you're going to hear from a couple wonderful people, and they're going to give you a lot of information, and they're going to get you excited. Every one of us is here tonight for a reason. We're here because there's a call placed upon our lives to protect these children and to protect our mothers. And I'm asking you tonight that as you're here and you're enjoying dinner and you're enjoying this company, that you will not just walk away with a better understanding, that you won't just walk away with some more knowledge and some more information, but you will walk away with a renewed call on your life to protect these children from abortion. And I also would ask that if you believe that God is calling you to help out the land center, that you would come see me afterwards and talk to me and get some more information. If you open up your uh, program, the very the inside front cover, I have some information about our walk for life. Can you imagine the impact that we would have if every person in this room got involved? If every person decided that there are too many of our children being lost to abortion, and we need to make a difference. Well, I'm, I'm right here in the middle of the room. If you want to ask me questions later, I'd love to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here tonight, and thank you for your support. Thank you very much. Um, Diane and Diane at this one table on either side of Father Kuba, and we spell it the same in the room there. We did friends. Uh, I didn't have time to prepare any remarks. Aren't you glad? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I says recognition in the program. I think that's what I'm supposed to do. And it's always a challenge because I just want to thank, first of all, every single person in the room. That'll cover it. Yay! Let's give everybody a hand. Thank you. I know many of you by your faces and others by your name. And why would that be? Because I made a spreadsheet with the names, and we have people concerned for the Inborn Child, Newcastle has 1,380 something, I forget the last one, on our mailing list. And we have, so I do the, you know, the, it's called a spreadsheet. <laughs> and uh, it takes a lot of time and attention. So, um, I think I'm going to say my reading words and then we'll have the recognition. They're not my words. They're words of people you might know, have known about. I want to say that on this day, April 14, in 1865, a major thing happened in our country. Who knows what that was? Raise your hand. There's a historian in every room. Would you like to get up and tell them what happened? Who is this that is rising? State your name. Paul Francis. Paul Francis. And what happened was Lincoln was assassinated. Yeah, the assassination. I can tell you the play, but I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a, you know, I thought, why did I choose, if we choose the date of April 14th? And I think it was in part because I had seen that somewhere. The date, April 14, 1865. So I'm going to read a little bit about Abraham. Democrats accused Lincoln of being a tyrant because he prescribed civil liberties. For example, he suspended, now the judge over here will understand this, I don't know much about it. Um, he, he suspended the writ of habeas corpus in some areas as early as April 27, 1861, and throughout the nation on September 24, 1862. And the administration made over 13,000 arbitrary, arbitrary arrests 
On the other hand, Lincoln tolerated, get this, virulent criticism from the press and politicians. Often restrained his commanders from overzealous arrests and showed no real tendencies toward becoming a dictator. There was never a hint that Lincoln might propose to postpone the election of 1864, although he feared in August of that year that he would surely lose to McClellan. Democrats exaggerated Lincoln's suppression, the press's suppression of civil liberties, in part because wartime prosperity robbed them of economic issues and in part because Lincoln handled the slavery issue so skillfully. So, um, I don't want to go on and on, but the preliminary emancipation proclamation of September 22, 1862 bore this military justification as did all of Lincoln's racial me measures, including especially his decision in the final proclamation of January 1st, 1863, to accept blacks in the army. And then down here later, on April 14th, 1865, five days after Robert E. Lee's surrender to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Lincoln attended a performance of our Amer American cousin at Ford Theater in Washington. There, Ruth entered the presidential box and shot him the next morning he died. And that was 151 years ago, if I get my math right. Lincoln's achievements, saving the Union and freeing the slaves, and his martyrdom just at the war's end, assured his continuing pain. And why did I bring up? Because it took over a hundred years or more to rid this country of slavery. And abortion, another evil as slavery was, has come to our country in 1973. So we may not be able to see the end. It may take a hundred years. We don't feel that way, and we have passion, and we want to make it stop today. And if, with all of us working together, our pastors especially helping us, we, we can make a difference in our own county, as Sarah Bowen talked about. And God bless Sarah and all of the people at the Mount Alpha Omega Centers. Did you say they're in Slippery Rock and Newcastle, right? I, I, you probably did. I'm functioning on low sleep for the week. <laughs> so, I wanted you to hear that. And then I wanted you to want to read from one other current president's, just one couple of sentences. And th this is from Ronald Reagan. The ultimate determinant in the struggle now going on for the world will, for the world, will not be bombs and rockets, but a test of wills and ideas, a trial of spiritual resolve. The values we hold, the beliefs we cherish, and the ideas to which we are dedicated. In other words, in my opinion, that's my phone line. It is. I mean, so, each of us, how many of them have called themselves a Christian? And, and we are of the Protestant and Catholic denominations in this room. And if we all can work together, we can make a difference. And with that, our main speakers will start. Thank you very much. Um, before we introduce our speakers, I would ask that if you would put your cell phones on vibrating. <laughs> 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 the 
scriptures in the Old Testament and Psalms that set time to favor Zion and that. With these two wonderful speakers that we have, I feel them. And I really sense in my spirit that heaven is smiling upon not only our city of Newcastle, but our county, Lawrence County, even our state, Pennsylvania. In 1993, Father Obama was chosen by Cardinal John O'Connor of New York City to form Priest for Life. The chief mission of Priest for Life is to unite, encourage, and provide ongoing training for the priests and leaders to give a special emphasis to the life issues, especially abortion, euthanasia, and their ministries. Another ministry is to assist clergy and laity to work together productively for the cause of life. He sees and shares these missions. Father Barone is one of the most prominent pro-life leaders in the world. Originally from New York, he was ordained in 1988 by Cardinal John O'Connor, and since 1993 has served full-time pro-life leadership with his mission for mission. He is the National Director of Priests for Life, the largest pro-life ministry in the Catholic Church, and he is also the President of the National Pro-Life Religious Council, the National Pastoral Director of Silent No More Awareness Campaign, and the Rachel Vendors to work largest, the world's largest ministry of healing after abortion. He travels throughout the country to average of four states every week Preaching and teaching against abortion. Father Frank produces programs regularly for religious and secular radio and television networks. He was asked by Mother Teresa to speak in, in India on the life issue and has addressed the pro life caucus of the United States House of Representatives. He received the Proudly Pro Life Award by the National Right to Life Committee and numerous other pro-life awards and honorary doctors. He is the author of four book, books in the abortion, not just fighting it, pro-life reflections for every day, abolishing abortion, and proclaiming the message for life. Norma McCovey, the Jenny Roe of uh, the Supreme Court's Roe versus Wade abortion decision, called Frank, Father Frank, the catalyst that brought me into the Catholic Church. Let me introduce to you my own the Reverend Frank A. Above. Thank you. 
for focusing, and thank you for what you do to carry it out. I also want to say what a pleasure it is for me tonight to be with uh, my brother and colleague, uh, Max Saber, from whom we will hear in a little while as well. Matt and I are, we are together on many battlefronts and many places across the country, and it is always good to interact and to, uh, to do what we can to collaborate and to support one another's efforts, and Matt, I look forward to your words tonight as well. Uh, I want to thank my brothers in the clergy, uh, those of you who introduced yourselves here, my brother priests and pastors from various different denominations. Isn't it marvelous how God, looking down at this horrific evil, this holocaust of abortion, is able to draw good out of evil and is able to say, I'm bringing my body together to confront this evil. We are coming together. Those of you who hold and are seeking public office, thank you for your work, for your service. I'm going to say something uh, here tonight about the elections, and I want to thank you for giving the witness to life in public office. You know, brothers and sisters, we've got to elect public servants. We know the difference between serving the public and killing the public. And anybody who doesn't know that difference doesn't belong in public office. Now I want to bring you the greetings of my entire team at Greece for Life. We are a family of ministries, and I want to bring you the greetings of our the other priests who serve us full time, and of Janet Moran, our executive director, who also co-founded a Silent No More campaign. I want to say a, a quick word about that tonight. Uh, I bring you the greetings of Dr. Jesus and Kevin Burke, who founded Rachel's Vigor. I know you're familiar with that and, and operates under our umbrella of Priest of Life. And also greetings to you tonight from Dr. Alfie King, who was here a few years ago as your speaker, and uh, who heads up, of course, our African American outreach. And as the niece of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, you know, when, she, when she first started working with me full time, uh, back now over 10 years ago, we were marching together at the March for Life in D.C. And I turned to her and I said, so does this remind you of the uh, civil rights marches uh, with, your, with your uncle in the, in the civil rights movement? And she said, well, Frank, this is the civil rights movement. And it is the civil rights movement of today. Because it's the same principle. Everyone should be protected. Everyone should be recognized as equal under the law. So if the evil of society takes that equality away from our black brothers and sisters, we rise up and we stand for that equality and we stand together for justice. And if the evil of a particular day takes that equality away from the smallest and youngest children, we rise up again with the same passion based on the same truth and we give witness to the same equality and the same demands of justice. It's the same movement, brothers and sisters. And that's why it will prevail and is prevailing. Because as was said in the civil rights movement, so we say in the pro-life movement, no lie can live forever. No lie can live forever. You know, uh, of course we all heard the, uh, the flap that happened recently with Donald Trump being asked about abortion and saying, after being asked, well, should there be some punishment for the woman? And he misspoke. Well, first of all, he spoke correctly. Just the question, should there be some punishment? Well, of course. But the person to be punished, of course, is the abortionist. And when it comes to the woman, well, he misspoke and then he retracted his, his misstatement. But brothers and sisters, a couple of things to notice here. First of all, as soon as that statement came out, many of us in the national leadership, including myself, put out statements right away. And I said, listen, we've been saying for decades, we don't have to put it into prison, and we don't want to put it into prison women who have abortions. Because women who have had abortions are already in prison. And it is our goal to liberate them. It is our mission to set them free. It is our mission to take them from the dark corner in which they are hiding with their faces to the ground, ashamed to even lift up their eyes to the heavens. And our job is to go over there and take their hand and turn their despair into hope and go into their darkness and say, there is one who stands with light shining on you. He is a savior. His blood has been shed to free you even from the sin of abortion. Arise from your despair. Arise from your shame. Arise from your prison. That's why I'm so privileged to be the pastoral director of 
Rachel's video that you know brothers and sisters, especially for those of you who are, are of the Catholic faith, I want you to know how much this year of mercy is an opportunity for us to promote the cause of life and the cause of healing after abortion. Now, because of the work that Peace for Life does at the Vatican, I've been privileged to speak with Pope Francis on five different occasions. And when I first introduced uh, to him the, uh, the different work that we do, and I mentioned Rachel Zinger, he stopped me and he said, Rachel Zinger, that is an excellent work. That is good. Go forward with that. Because he knew about it from Argentina. And now we're declaring this year of mercy. Remember, there's a twofold meaning to this. Mercy is not just about the forgiveness of sins. Mercy is about intervening to help the helpless. God's first act of mercy to you was not when he forgave your first sin. It was when he made you out of nothing. There's mercy. You couldn't ask for it. You couldn't earn it. But he made you anyway. He wants to share his life. He wants to share his love. And he wants to share it forever. And therefore, mercy means, and Pope Francis pointed this out in his document last year, explaining the year of mercy, mercy means we run to the helpless and we intervene for them and we lift them up and we rescue them just like God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt and just like he rescues us from the kingdom of sin and death by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is mercy. And we can't receive mercy unless we give it. We can't say, Lord, have mercy, save me, because I can't save myself. And then we turn a deaf ear to our brothers and sisters who are saying to us, I can't save myself, have mercy on me. And that's the cry of the unborn child. Let's use this year of mercy to reach out to both to the children and to their moms and dads who are in such despair that they think it's a solution to kill them. We reach out with mercy, not only to these moms, not only to these dads, but through our Silent No More campaign, many of you may be aware of our initiative called Healing the Shock Waves of Abortion. I want to bring this to your attention. Those of us who are pastors, this is a powerful way to preach about this issue. Let me just trace something for you real quickly. But all of us brothers and sisters, we can use this as we talk to our friends and, and relatives and neighbors about abortion. It's, it's the assertion of the other side that this is some kind of personal, private choice. Does it affect anybody except the one choosing it? Well, obviously, of course, they have a big blind spot for the baby who gets torn apart. But beyond that, personal, private decision? Well, not only do we know more than ever before now about how it hurts mom and it hurts dad, but did you ever consider how it hurts the grandparents? The mother and father of that young mom who was pregnant and afraid are often the ones who pressured her to abort, or on the other hand, may have tried to save their grandchild but couldn't, or yet again, maybe didn't even know about the abortion until it was too late. Have we considered the kind of grief and pain, the kind of mourning and repentance that they have to journey through the rest of their lives? And then what about the siblings? You know how many people that are hard in this country? Only God knows the number. Who are quite aware that they have lost brothers and sisters to abortion. That's a loss for them. That's a pain and a grief for them. And with psychiatrists that we work with and psychologists who are studying this phenomenon, we have only just begun to scratch the surface of understanding what has come to be known as abortion survivor syndrome. The impact it has on our young people to realize they could have been aborted, and the further impact on those to know that their own mom and dad had one or more of their siblings killed. This rocks the foundation of their life and their world in a way that we have only barely begun to understand. The aunts, the uncles, the cousins, the whole family suffers the loss of a child who is aborted. And then, of course, the impact on the friends, the friends who cooperated with or pressured or brought their friend to have that abortion, and we all suffer. The abortionists suffer. We have a ministry of healing of former abortionists. I had a retreat not long ago, five women who had worked in the abortion industry. Among those five women, you know how many lives they took? Half a million lives. Five women. And they sat there in a the circle, and they lifted up their hands, and they said, Father Frank, these hands were, were covered and splattered with the blood of these babies. By the end of that retreat, they were lifting up those 
those same hands and they had tears on those same faces and they were saying, and now these hands have been splattered by another blood. By another blood, the blood of Jesus Christ that speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. We're healing these former abortionists, but brothers and sisters, they suffer their whole life long. Let nobody ever dare to claim that this is some kind of isolated, private, personal choice. Nonsense. There is nothing destroying families more than abortion does. There is nothing ripping apart the fabric of our society more than abortion does. And that is why, let me go back to the comments of Donald Trump. He corrected himself. And you know what else I said in my statement when he made that this statement? I said, I would much rather prefer, if I had to choose, the kind of mistake that he made and then corrected than the kind of mistake we hear coming out of the mouth of Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders that they refuse to correct that says there is an unabortion that they don't like. Did you hear the question that was asked of them by Greg Bear on the Fox News Channel Hall last month? He asked a riveting question that had not been asked in any Democratic debate or town hall up to that point. And here was the question. Can you name a single circumstance at any time in place where it would be okay with you that an abortion be illegal? A single circumstance. There was an open ended question. We could be talking about the end of the ninth month of pregnancy. We could be talking about a healthy mother carrying a healthy baby at nine months and she wants to have an abortion because she wanted a boy and this is a girl. Can you think of any circumstance in which it would be okay for you that that baby be protected? They could have named a single one. You tell me what's worse. You know, at least somebody who thinks there needs to be some corrective measure of justice when a child is ripped apart, is somewhere going in the right direction. But when we have people running from the highest office in the land, who, who have such a blind spot to the violence of tearing these babies apart, brothers and sisters, we have a far more devastating mistake on our hands. And they're not even willing to see the light. You know, this brings up an initiative right now in the state of Pennsylvania. And we at Reach for Life are working with other states to bring this about. I was at the side of Governor Sam Brownback of Kansas last year when he became the first governor in the land to sign this particular measure into law. Oklahoma quickly followed the following week, and now several other states are working on a measure that protects babies in the womb from dismemberment abortion. Now you know, we have, some, we have some state legislators here tonight, and many others of you here work hard at lobbying. God bless you for the introduction of this particular measure. We are going to work side by side with you to make sure this gets passed into law, not only in Pennsylvania, but across the nation. And I think we are already in dialogue and active collaboration with our federal legislators to make sure that this becomes law across the country on the federal level, too. That children be protected from this government abortion. Now, listen, obviously, we all know every abortion, no matter what stage of the, of the development of the baby and no matter what method is used, Every abortion is equally wrong from a moral point of view. We are not saying when we introduce a piece of specific legislation like this that has a limited uh, uh, amount of protection, we are not saying that the other, baby, the other babies are not worth protecting or that the other abortions are okay. Don't think for a moment that that's what's being said. What's being said, however, is that when you have the legislative support to protect some of the babies, you are obliged to protect them. When you have the support among the public to, to, to start protecting some of these lives, what are we waiting for? You, of course you have to act at that moment. And that's perfectly compatible with having the determined resolve to protect them all. But brothers and sisters, let me talk to you about this. While every abortion is equally wrong from a moral point of view, not every abortion, not every procedure have the same psychological impact on the general public when you describe the procedure. Mark my words, 
words, anyone who speaks, whether it's a, a, a professor at a university or a politician on a campaign speech or, or the president of the United States, anybody who gets up and gives a speech in favor of legal abortion, there are some words you will never hear them say in any of those speeches. Never see if you read them right in any of their articles. And those words include dismemberment, decapitation, forceps, blood, arms, legs, feet, hands. You know where you will find those words, however? In the medical textbooks that have you do an abortion. Oh yeah, you'll find the word decapitation in Warren Hearn's uh, abortion practice medical textbook. You'll find the word dismemberment. When this ban on dismemberment abortion, and it actually it's better to talk in terms of protecting babies from dismemberment, was debated in Kansas, the first state to pass it, do you know that the two senators who stood up to oppose the bill couldn't even mention the name of the bill? And the Planned Parenthood press release that came out opposing the ban on dismemberment, the press release opposing the bill didn't even mention the name of the bill. Why? Because the, in the name of the bill was the word discernment. The last thing supporters of abortion want to talk about is abortion. And when you're supporting something, when you see someone supporting something that they're not even willing to describe, there you know that person has got the wrong position. Brothers and sisters, push forward in this way. Because we have a tremendous disconnect in this society and in this government about who this child is. And again, I go back to the, the name of the group. People concerned for the unborn child. Yes, focus on that child. We have such a blind spot on who this child is and on what abortion does to this child. I bring this up at great length. I give a, men, a lot of the other examples of the great disconnect that we see in our political life and our academic life. In my latest book, Abolishing Abortion, I've got a number of copies on that table over there by that big mirror, and I hope you'll take some moments uh, to uh, go over there before you leave tonight, not only to see this literature that I've brought, but also various other groups have important materials there on that table. And what this leads us to, we talk about this blind spot, we talk about good kinds of legislation, like protecting babies from dismemberment. That leads us into, of course, the final consideration uh, that I want to just comment on a little bit, and that is this election that we are in the midst of this year. We're going to say, I left on your, on your tables here a little prayer, an election prayer. I want to say that with you at the end of your, my remarks. But brothers and sisters, that's another thing I go into in my book, is that, and I say this to my brothers and sisters here who are pastors, as I've already said, we, the people of God, need to elect public servants who know the difference between serving the public and killing the public. And I want to say to my brothers and sisters here who are pastors, you and I need to be able to say that from the moment. Just that way. You and I need to be able to say to our brothers and sisters in our congregations, if a politician can't respect the life of a little baby, how is he supposed to respect yours? Amen. We're supposed to say to our brothers and sisters in our congregations, we have been filled with God's Spirit. We have been formed by His Word. That's today, the prevailing Word. Right? To do what? Not to stay in the four walls of the church, brothers and sisters, but to go out of those four walls and to make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. King of kings, Lord of lords, that sounds pretty political to me. I'm not talking about the church becoming an arm of a political party, not at all. As active citizens, we should be involved in the campaigns of the candidates who want to support them. Support the parties that we want to belong to. That's the, that's the job of citizens. It's not the job of the church. I'm not saying the church 
needs to be going up there and endorses the candidates? No, 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 no. But we do get up and identify the moral evils of our time. We shed the light of the Word of God, not on some abstract thing happening God knows where in some hypothetical land, but happening here and now in the United States of America. We've got to be specific. So we get up and we tell people about their duty to vote, and we tell them that the first purpose of government is the protection of life. And so that therefore, as we elect men and women to public office, if they think they have a veto power over human rights, don't give them your vote because they don't understand the kind of authority you're giving them when you vote for them. You're not giving them a vote to have a veto power over human rights. You know, I was, I was asked, one of my favorite invitations to preach was on the day that the House of Representatives voted on Obamacare. Back in the spring of 2010, you know they had their vote on a Sunday afternoon. And we have a lot of church-going members of, in Congress in Washington. A lot of church-going members. So you know what they decided to do? They weren't going to miss the vote. So they decided to have church on Sunday morning inside the Capitol. And they invited me to preach. <laughs> I got some courageous men and women over there. So I came down and I said to them, listen, Jesus Christ has transformed politics. See, the problem when you talk about talking about politics in church, some people say, ah, oh, the church has become too political. Listen, that's not the problem. The problem is our politics have become too big. And it's time for the church to rise up and say, Jesus Christ has, has, has revolutionized politics because of the pagan view. Well, the law comes from the mouth of the king. The king gets up, speaks the law. Nobody has any input into it or recourse against it. The people don't matter. Their voices don't count. Jesus Christ comes along. You are a son. You are a daughter of God. I live in you. You live in me. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Then, of course, you matter. Of course your voice counts. And that's what revolutionizes politics and makes it representative so that now, in Jesus Christ, authority and power are transformed into service. Service. Service that protects rights given by God. Not by a court, not by a Congress, not by a president. We've got to move forward in a way that we have the freedom to preach about these things. And I'm often told, and maybe some of you who are pastors are told this too, and I know Matt deals with this in the legal arena also, in giving pastors guidance. Let me give you a little litmus test about whether you're crossing the line here of what you say in the pulpit if it's too political. I'm sometimes told that when I say things like I'm saying here tonight, oh, Father Frank, you're just endorsing Republican candidates. You're being too partisan. Oh, really? So when I get up and say that we have to elect people who are going to defend human life and protect you and children, I'm going to help some candidates and I'm going to hurt some others. I'm going to discredit some party and I'm going to favor another. Is that what you're saying? Okay, I admit that. Whose fault is that? If tomorrow the candidates in any given race would swap their positions on abortion, if tomorrow the Republican and Democratic parties were to switch positions on abortion, tell me what would change about my message. What paragraph would be different? What sentence would have to be rewritten? What word would have to be dropped or added? And the answer is none, because we don't stand to preach on the Democratic platform. We don't stand and preach from the Republican platform. We stand and preach from the platform of Jesus Christ.
first to challenge this HHS mandate back at the beginning of 2012. We challenged it in the district court. We challenged it in the Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. And now we challenge it in the Supreme Court. And we will continue to challenge it. And whether that court rules for us or against us, we will obey God rather than that. providing our insurance policy coverage for things that we teach people shouldn't do that are immoral and some of these things take human lives. But the principle at stake here goes way beyond the specific issues of abortion and contraception. It's very simple. The government can never force a believer to violate their faith. You can't give a citizen a choice between following their faith and following the law. It's not only unconstitutional, it's illegal. It's illegal under federal law for any government agency to do that to a believer. And furthermore, it's not the court that decides what we believe. It's we who do. And so in so many of these, these judgments, these negative judgments we got in the lower courts, you know what they were telling us? We were saying, look, according to our faith, you're, you're, you're making us morally complicit in evil. You're making us cooperate in evil activities. And you know what the government dared, dared to say to us? No, 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 you misunderstand. You're not complicit. Excuse me, Judge So-and-so. Not only are you not qualified to answer that question, you're not even qualified to ask it. It is not the role of the courts, and the Supreme Court has admitted this in Hobby Lobby and other decisions. It is not the role of the court to judge the logic, the validity, the persuasiveness of any religious belief. The government is free to disagree with our beliefs. It is not free to disregard them. When we believe, it is we the believer who draw the line between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. And the role of the government is not to say that line ought to be someplace else. The role of the government is to say, if this is what you sincerely believe, we are going to defend and protect your right to live out that belief. That's what this is about. That's what this case is about. And I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, to join me and the other petitioners in this case in praying further for a victory, because the victory for religious freedom is a victory for the freedom to defend life. Right. A few quick things before I conclude. There is also on that table a little devotional booklet. Now, some of you actually brought your copies tonight and said, I've been playing this for years. Uh, this is pro-life reflections for every day, every day of the year. A little reflection, scripture, quote, prayer, written in, a, in an interdenominational way. And uh, in, I am so glad for what you did here tonight. Everybody got one of these little envelopes with various literature in it. And as far as what I put in there, I want to point out something that you can use as a handout in churches or elsewhere. You can save someone's life today. It contains some basic facts about abortion, alternatives to abortion, healing and forgiveness after abortion, some of the things I already mentioned to you, and social media. How many of you have an Instagram account? I know this is not, come on, I see the younger people in the crowd, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. How many, of you, how many of you know how to take a selfie? Okay, I'm going to take a selfie right now with myself with all of you behind me. Wave, wave to the camera. I'm going to put that on my Instagram tonight. And uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, there's a sheet in that little envelope that tells you how you can connect with me and my ministry on these and other social media outlets for some of you. This is a language you've never heard of before with strange words, but uh, let me tell you something. It's helping advance the kingdom of God if you use it the right way. Uh, okay, you have a little prayer card on your tables, election prayer for life. Let's say this prayer as a conclusion of my remarks, and at the bottom, you'll find how you can be in touch with me and our ministry at Priests for Life. Again, my whole team sends you their gratitude for all that we do for life. Let's say this prayer today. O oh God, we acknowledge you today as Lord, not only of individuals, but of nations and governments. We thank you for the privilege of being able to organize ourselves politically and of knowing that political loyalty does not have to mean disloyalty to you. We thank you for your law, which our founding fathers acknowledged and recognized as higher than any human law. We thank you for the opportunity that this election year puts before us to exercise our sovereign duty, not 
not only a voter, but to influence countless others to vote and to vote correctly. Lord, we pray that your people may be awake. Let them realize that while politics is not their salvation, their response to you requires that they be politically active. Awaken your people to know that they are not all to be a sect fleeing the world, but rather a community of faith renewing the world. Awaken them to that same hands lifted up to you in prayer, are the hands that pull the lever in the voting booth, that the same eyes that read your word are the eyes that read names on the ballot, and that they do not cease to be Christians when they enter the voting booth. Awaken your people to a commitment to justice, to the sanctity of marriage and family, to the dignity of each individual human life, and to the truth that human rights begin when human lives begin, and not one moment later. Lord, we rejoice today that we are citizens of your kingdom. May that make us all the more committed to be faithful citizens on earth. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, Jesus Christ is risen. Let us proclaim it and let us save this nation. God bless.
opportunity to be here on the same platform with you as a friend and as a colleague and as a, uh, a person who has been in there standing for human life. So thank you very much. Um, just, a, just a note of correction, I'm no longer the Vice President of Liberty University or the Dean and Professor of Law at Liberty University School of Law. I was, uh, but I transitioned out from that particular role in 2014. I helped start the Law School at Liberty University. I would say the Dean there at Liberty University. In fact, I recruited Dr. Alvia King's daughter and son to come to the Law School, and I had the privilege of seeing them both there for three years and giving them the the hood at the end of the graduation and seeing them go on to practice law afterward. Uh, Dr. Alvita King, who works with uh, Priest for Life, has been a longtime friend of mine. But I uh, knew Dr. Fowle back in the 1990s, and the idea of starting a law school began to percolate between he and I. Liberty Council is independent of Liberty University, although it has the same scriptural model, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Spirit of the Lord who is there is liberty. But we're independent, and uh, as a result of our friendship and working together, the law school at Liberty University became a reality. And I ended up doing the deanship as well as Liberty Council at the same time, taking it through all the levels of accreditation. So when that finally occurred through all the final levels and the reaffirmation of accreditation in 2014, I had transitioned out because I felt a need to be focused exclusively and full-time on the culture issues. And it was in that month, October of 2014, that the Supreme Court denied a review on several cases involving same-sex marriage, and same-sex marriage went like wildfire across the country before. The uh, wrong, lawless, frankly, decision by five lawyers last year on the issue of marriage. And so we have been very much involved at Liberty Council. We have offices in Florida, Washington, D.C., Virginia, hundreds of affiliate attorneys in all 50 states, but we're more than a public interest law firm. Uh, we are also a policy organization, CBS News did a special last night on the fact that we're involved in 21 states right now over these so-called uh, bathroom bills for a better uh, terminology uh, in that. But we're also uh, involved in much more. The Liberty Council also has Liberty Relief International, which is an international humanitarian relief brand or our arm of Liberty Council, in which we raise hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, uh, every year to provide help for persecuted Christians, particularly in the Middle East. Amen. And uh, we're involved in that on a regular daily basis of unbelievable, uh, indescribable kinds of atrocities that are happening to people who call the name of Jesus Christ. I'll talk about that just in a, in a moment, but before I get to the essence of my message, I graduated before I went into law school from seminary. My calling was to go into the pastoral field, and, and I feel that I'm doing that role in this role that I'm doing now. It's a combination of pastoral as well as legal. But I did not envision the legal component. I graduated from seminary with a 4.0. I knew Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac. I learned French from my master's degree. And I knew all the biblical languages and archaeology and I preached and I took the homiletics courses and all the history courses, early and ancient history and so forth. And I was preaching uh, in a church after graduating from law school, after graduating from seminary. Planning to go on to Princeton University for a PhD. But if you had asked me at the time, as a pastor, having those kinds of educational credentials, what my position was on abortion, I would have told you that I was pro-abortion. I knew all the Bible, I knew the exegesis, I knew all these different languages and history, and I didn't know anything about abortion. What I knew about abortion was what I read in the media, what I heard on the TV. And what I thought it was, was that it was uh, a high, it was a concentrated menstrual cycle. It wasn't a human being that was being expelled at the time of abortion. It just simply was it. So if you would have asked me, I would have said I would be in favor of a woman's right to have an abortion. And that all changed when a dedicated Catholic and Protestant in Kentucky decided that they wanted to reach pastors. And they decided that they were going to show a video. At the time, that video was real to real. And it was a video that was called The Sign of Life. Dr. Wilkie was on that video, 
the others were on that video, and the pastor said, a group of us are going to watch this video, and we'd like to join you. I was part of a ministerial, non-denominational, non monthly meeting group of ministers from cross denominations. And so we got together, and these two, Catholic and Protestant, this was their first group of pastors in Kentucky that they showed this video to. It was 1982, 1983, right at the time frame. And I watched this video, had no idea what I was getting ready to watch, and I saw this abortion. I saw the Life Magazine 1965 photographs from the Life Magazine. I now have two original of those in my home, in my office. Those were amazing video, amazing pictures before ultrasound. We have the baby on the front cover of that large magazine. And on the inside, it showed from conception all the way through the late second, early third trimester of abortion. Showed those in this real, real movie that we were watching. In addition to that, it showed the aftermath of abortion. It's the first time I've ever seen this. It was a silver uh, platform, like a stainless steel placed in a medical facility. And the little babies, these were first trimester abortions that they were showing. These little babies were there on that steel, uh, stainless steel, cold metal. And you could see their rib cages, you could see their hands, you could see their fingers and their toes and their feet and their arms and their legs. You could see their skull and the eyes and their head. And when I saw that, I thought, where in the world have I been all my life? As a pastor, I was ashamed of myself. That I had studied the scripture and I didn't know the most important cultural issue that was happening in my community. And I would have given the wrong answer had somebody asked me that question. Fortunately, no one did ask me that question. And it showed the controversy in front of the Supreme Court and the protesting and it gave all the information about how the Supreme Court Roe versus Wade came about. And so afterward, I looked up right to life in the, at the time, the pages of the phone book. And I called this lady, and it was a lady who was with the Central Kentucky Right to Life. The phone went to her home. I came to her house. Never knew anything about Right to Life before that. And I asked her for every piece of literature she had. And I asked her for Roe versus Wade. She said, I don't have that, but you can get that at the University of Kentucky Law Library. So I went from her house to the University of Kentucky Law Library, went to the front desk, and I asked them for Roe versus Wade. They called the librarian in. They took me to the Sachs, pulled this book off the shelf, opened it up, and showed me where it was. I went there and paid, I think it was five cents a page to copy that. And I took it home and I read it. I didn't know anything about law. I had no thinking that I was going to go into law school, but when I read that, it just didn't make sense to me. It made no sense, the conclusion that they ultimately came to. In fact, as you begin reading that Roe versus Wade, before you get to the conclusion, you would think that they would go the other way, because they would say that through the history there was this protection of life, and then there was the common law, and then there was the statutes, and even the American Medical Association had a position that was opposed to abortion. And then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, they couldn't find in the Constitution where it came from. It was in the penumbra, like the emanations that come out of an eclipse around the edges of the moon. It's like these things, there's something in the Constitution somewhere that gives a right, not just to abortion during certain times of the nine months, but all nine months. And it made no sense to me. And as a result of that, I got very involved in the Right to Life movement, and we formed campus, Right to Life, on the University of Kentucky campus, and that's what led me from going in the pastoral ministry into the legal ministry. It was in my constitutional law classes that were my favorite classes. That's what the background was for me coming pro life. It was like being slapped in the face when I saw those photographs. And you know, where we are today, we're living in unprecedented times. You know, every generation before us, they all said that their generation now is worse than it was before. It's natural to think that. But we really are living in unprecedented times in American history. In some of the times are unprecedented in world history. I'll come back to American history later. But we're living in unprecedented times. Why? Because never in the history of America or the history of the world has any government on the planet ever constricted its citizens to participate in human genocide? 
Now, there have been governments that have participated in human genocide. Nazi Germany, Rwanda, you name it, Pol Pot, all these different places. They participated in human genocide. They perpetrated human genocide. But they didn't conscript the citizens as a whole to participate and be complicit in it. The citizens could sit on the sideline, they could protest, they could be dismayed, but they weren't forced to participate in front of the gas chambers in Nazi Germany. And yet, for the first time in not only American history, but of any government in the world on the planet in world history, now we're living in a country, the United States of America, in which the citizens are being forced to participate in human genocide. We, Liberty Council, represented Liberty University, and filed the first lawsuit, the private lawsuit, challenging Obamacare on the very day that it was filed, was signed by President Obama in March of 2013. Florida filed, the state, and Virginia filed, and we filed Liberty University at all against uh, the Obamacare law. And I argued it at the Court of Appeals in the first of the three days of the original argument on Obamacare was our issue that we put before in the Liberty University versus Medicaid case. You know, Liberty University preached our lives, little sisters of the poor. I can tell you one thing. What they are being told is that it's a prerequisite to training champions for Christ at Liberty University. As a prerequisite to being the mission that Reverend Rabone is doing, promoting the sanctity of human life and encouraging pastors and priests to get involved. Little Sisters of the Poor is a prerequisite for your calling that God has placed on your heart to minister to the downtrodden, the elderly, the disabled, the people that are kicked to the side of the curb as a prerequisite to do that will for now allow you to do that if you kill children. I can tell you one thing. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says later this year. It is completely irrelevant to me and to many others what those justices say on that Supreme Court, Liberty University, Priests for Life, Little Sisters of the Poor, and you name a whole laundry list if the Supreme Court doesn't go the right way. They will follow God rather than man. Because this Obamacare law also has a provision that requires individuals to pay a separate premium in a segregated account that doesn't go to your insurance, but it goes to a segregated fund. If anywhere within the coverage umbrella, it provides abortion to anyone within that network. And if you are part of that, then you have to pay a separate individual payment over and above your premium, and it goes to one segregated fund, and it's not for knee surgeries or for tonsillectomies, it's for the killing of innocent children. <coughs> Never before in the history of the world has a government conscripted its citizens to actually be complicit in human genocide until now. And we can talk about this also in the context of the deconstruction of God's created natural order of marriage as the union of a man and a woman. We're having the same kind of issue happen there as well, where people are being forced not to serve a hamburger to somebody who's gay or lesbian. That's not the issue. But being forced to participate in a ceremony, the ceremony of which is infused with meaning, the meaning of which is contrary to the natural created order, to natural law, and to reveal law. Never before are you being required as a requirement of your employment or of your license. I know that my law license is going to be hanging in the balance over this issue as the American Bar Association right now is considering a rule change in this particular area. I know the accreditation of Liberty University School of Law and every other school of law and every university is going to be in the crosshairs on this issue. We are coming to a place, ladies and gentlemen, where we have to make a decision, where we have to make a decision like Dietrich Bonhoeffer made a decision, like Martin Niemöller made a decision, we are coming to the position where we are in the same place that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had to make a decision, where the founders of this country had to make a decision that we will either obey God or we will obey man. And when those two directly and irrevocably 
collide with one another, we are in a position like Daniel in the lion's den, like the three Hebrews that would not bow down, like Esther, who ultimately put her life on the line and engaged in civil resistance against the most powerful king on the planet. We are coming to that moment in time. When we have five lawyers on the Supreme Court, and I've had the opportunity to argue here, I've written lots of briefs, I've been a dean of a law school, I've been a tenured law school professor, I've taught constitutional law, I know all of that issue. But when we have five lawyers on the Supreme Court, that not only contradict themselves within a two-year period, because in June of 2013, they said states have the right to define marriage, and in June of 2015, they said states don't have the right to define marriage, Frankly, states don't have the right to define marriage to begin with any more than they have the right to redefine gravity. It is what it is. It's part of the natural creation. But they contradict themselves in a period of two years, and as Chief Justice John Roberts said, the five lawyers, that's his term, not mine, they impose their will not a legal judgment, not based on the Constitution, not based on the court's precedent. That's a lawless opinion. When are we going to stop playing charades and pretend that whatever those five people say, whoever they might be, whatever they say, no matter how devoid of the Constitution it may be, that it becomes the law of the land. It doesn't. If that's your belief system, if you have gotten so brainwashed to think that whatever those five people in Washington, D.C. say, we now have to march to like toy soldiers because they say so, irrespective of the fact that they have no authority under the Constitution to do it, then you would support Dred Scott. You would support Buck versus Bell because those decisions came down from the United States Supreme Court as well. And those decisions of Dred Scott by the Supreme Court, they said that blacks were not entitled to citizenship, and therefore, you can't bring your, your case in court. We had to fight a civil war to overturn that nonsense. And in Buck versus Bill, they said that Harry Buck, yes, Virginia can sterilize you as part of the eugenics movement because you've got low IQ and the eminent, depends upon how you look at him, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote, who in fact was a eugenist advocate because his father, a medical doctor, was also a very prominent eugenics advocate. He wrote the decision and said, sorry, Gary Buck, quote, three generations of imbeciles are enough, close quote. To the shame of this country, that eugenics law passed like wildfire across the country when the Supreme Court upheld Virginia's law and ruled against Gary Buck. And as a result of that, not only passed out of this country, but a man by the name of Adolf Hitler caught wind of it, and he used the Buck versus Bell Virginia model legislation for eugenics as the foundation of this eugenics movement. And guess what they did during the Nuremberg trials, when the Nazis were put on trial for war crimes? Guess what they cited to? You all did it in the United States. What's your big beef with us? It's called Buck versus Bell. We have to get away from the idea that whatever those five people say, we just have to be like toy soldiers and march. What these said in 1973 in a 7-2 decision, then again in 1992 in a 5-4 decision, which, by the way, you may not know, but after the argument in 1992, on the case coming out of this state, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, your governor, Casey, was the person named with that law that was regarding abortion, was challenged, and went before the United States Supreme Court. After that argument was done, and the justices voted, it was 5 4 to overrule Roe versus Wade. For 30 days, Rehnquist was writing the opinion. And O'Connor and Souter continued to lobby Anthony Kennedy. Anthony Kennedy, you've got to change your vote. 30 days, they continued to wait on him, and he wrote a little hand note to, Chief, to Justice Blackman, who wrote the original decision, who was still on the court. He says, I'd like to see you. Most of what I have to say, you will be pleased to hear. We have the note now in the archives. The next day, at the end of May, he saw Blackman, and he told Blackman to switch his vote. The opinion was taken away from Rehnquist, and it reached the next 30 days was five before to uphold the abortion decision. We were 30 days away from returning this country to the sanctity of human life 
And Anthony Kennedy was the swing vote who switched his vote. He's also the person who wrote this decision, this opinion. I don't even give it the respect of calling it a decision on marriage last year. He has a lot to deal with when he deconstructs God's creation. And he's the one from 1992 to the present that is solely responsible for the continuation of abortion. We in this country, friends, have to wake up to the atrocity of abortion. I said that the Liberty Council, one of our ministry outreaches among many, includes Liberty Relief International. We just had the awakening conference in Orlando where we had 43 speakers. And we had, among many of our breakouts and speaking uh, messages on persecuted Christians worldwide. We had a mobile tractor trailer museum that was parked out of the church's parking lot. And you walk in and have both sides, and both sides have photographs. And you start off with some of the photographs of Nazi Germany. But you quickly look at what's happening right now with ISIS and Al Qaeda and whatever other name you put on these uh, terrorists. And when you walk through this thing, it is the most unbelievable experience because what you see is indescribable. In one of the photographs, and these are photographs that these terrorists take because they actually hire professional photographers and they stage these things to make sure they get the right angle and the camera right away because they're literally doing a production for recruiting purposes. And these photographs include, one of them is four people in orange jumpsuits. And they have their arms bound behind their back and their ankles bound so that they're hanging with their arms and their legs up and their belly is kind of in a curve. That position alone would be excruciatingly painful. But to compound that, underneath all four of them is an open fire. They are literally roasting these human beings alive. There's another photograph in there where they have these cages. They show the picture of before and after, and they actually have a simulated cage there. In the before picture, they're in a cage. You see these things where people are put in cages and they're put on fire. But in this one, they're actually lowered into the water. They have the orange jumpsuits on. The first photograph that's in there is the water is up to their chin. All the people in this cage, the water is up to the chin, so only a little bit of the cage in their head. The chin is uh, above the water. In the next photograph, they've already been completely submerged, and they're raised back up, and all of them are completely dead. I mean, you can't even begin to imagine, friends, having that water level come up and grasping for air and succumbing. Can't imagine this. There's one photograph there that's also of a little girl, and she's got a little uh, frilly dress on, and she's being held up by her dad, but she has no head. You can't even begin to imagine. The atrocity that's happening. But you know, as much as we cry that kind of brutality, and certainly should, we are doing the same thing under the rubric of choice, under the idea that it's the rule of law, and the people up there in Washington, D.C., seven and 73 and 592 said the Constitution says so because we're decapitating children. We're ripping off their arms and legs. We're brutalizing them in the same way that these larger people are being brutalized by us. Now, we want to go in and bomb those countries, right? We want to go in and take them out to stop that brutality. In fact, there's even people there that have given videos, please bomb us so that we don't have to continue. These are people 
people who are under the control of ISIS, they're asking for us to bomb them, to get them out of their misery, to kill everyone, to stop the carnage. But that's happening in this country. And we drive by those places where our children are being brutalized in the same way. And we've got to stop playing the game as we always have. We've got to stop being serious about returning the sanctity of human life and the protections for all people, beginning with the most innocent, vulnerable from the moment of conception all the way through the spectrum of natural death. We've got to stand up as a church. We've got to stand up because God cannot, and I wouldn't even ask Him to, overlook this kind of sin. He will ultimately reap judgment on this country if we do not individually, as a church, and corporately repent of our sin and turn from our wicked ways. God cannot continue to allow this country to exist under those kinds of circumstances. Amen. He cannot bless America under those kinds of circumstances. I want God's blessing on this country. But He cannot bless this country when we're going down this path of destruction of the people who are created in His very image. I encourage you to stand up. You know, some people say, well, you know, there's, they've got exceptions for uh, abortion that it's okay in cases of rape and incest. It's not okay in cases of rape and incest. Not only is it not okay from an objective standpoint, but I have personal experience with both. Because I have a niece who is the product of both rape and incest. She was conceived because my father raped my sister. And as a result, she was born and she is now married, and she has her own child. I have two generations in my immediate family who are the product of my father's sin, raping my sister. As tragic as that was back then, so many years ago, my sister chose life. And she gave birth to Shelley. And Shelley gave birth to her daughter. And her daughter's going to give birth to some other daughters and sons later in life. Life is always the right choice. You don't undo a problem, no matter how horrendous it is, by compounding it with death. Life is the only choice that overcomes I just encourage you, we live in unprecedented times, and I'll just conclude with this. I said in American history, and as bleak as this whole picture sounds, and it is very serious in the times in which we live, they're not unprecedented in Judeo-Christian history, if you will. Because I can give you lots of examples, let me just give you one. At the time of Esther, Esther lived at a time in which the Persian kingdom was the most powerful planet on the earth. There was no other competing superpower that could come against the nation of Persia. And when the king issued a decree, not that you're going to lose your job, you're going to be made fun of, we're going to stigmatize you, we're going to put you in jail for a while, like Kim Davis, because she was a, a person who wanted to follow the Bible and God, or we're going to we're going to try to indict you like Susan Merrick, a person that we represent as well, who Thank God for her and David Lane. They revealed what was going on behind the closed doors of Planned Parenthood with selling human body parts. Instead of being indicted, she ought to be applauded. And in fact, we'll make sure that that indictment goes nowhere. But we have them living at a time where they're not just going to be losing their job or put in jail. The king issues a decree. And the decree says, if you're a Jew, you're going to die on a certain day. It's not hypothetical. It's not some parade of horribles that may come down the road. It's not some possibility. It's not just losing your ear. If you're going to die, if you're Jews, you're dead. Not only you, but your sisters, your brothers, your mom, your dad, your grandparents, all your family, all your friends, you're gone. 
and it's not very far away. And by the way, no one can come and help you. No country can come and overpower this nation because there's no other superpower that is capable of doing it. And by the way, you can't gather a bunch of signatures and put this on a citizen referendum and vote for it. You can't lobby your legislature. And in fact, you can't even go to the king and plead with him. If the king woke up the next day and told his wife, you know, honey, that was a stupid thing I did yesterday. He couldn't himself undo what he did. There is a day, it's coming, even the king of this most powerful country can't reverse it. You're all dying. You're dead. There's no more Israel. There's no more Jews. There's a point in history, and you're all gone. You can't get any worse than that, friends. But what happened? Mordecai prayed and fasted for three days, and Esther and her girls prayed and fasted for three days, and then she engaged in what I would call civil resistance, because she went against the law of the land. The law of the land was, you can't approach the king unless he summoned you. She put her life on the line and disobeyed Persian law. And we know what happened after that. The king gave her favor, and everything reversed. The king didn't reverse his order, he couldn't reverse the law. What he did is he issued another law. It's kind of like the beginning of the Second Amendment, if you will. It's the right that you can defend yourself. And so they defended themselves. And instead of the annihilation of Israel and the Jewish people, a point in history after which there is no more Israel and the Jewish people, today the Jewish people, just a few weeks ago, celebrated around the world the Feast of Purim. If God can turn that around through three days of fasting and prayer, something that is absolutely impossible to do, that God can turn this country around and return us back to Him, God can turn this country around and return this country to a country that literally can continue to be a shining city on the hill standing for human dignity in life. May that happen in our generation. I believe it will. May it happen in your communities, in your church, in this state, in our country, and may it be a ripple effect as an example for standing for life that impacts the rest of the world and echoes the issue. May God bless all of you who are so much involved in this. And may God continue to bless this country. Thank you. Thank you. So does anyone have a question for our wonderful guest here this evening? We'll go right to you and help bring you the mic if you have a question. And don't be afraid. Yes, we're here to learn, and I know I learned a tremendous amount of information. Someone will be the first one to be bold enough to ask a question. <laughs> you know, having gone through law school, my wife going through the law school, having been a dean in the law school, and uh, you know, knowing Justice Kagan when she was dean, Kagan before you know, when she was at Harvard, um, you know, it, that's a joke, frankly. Um, you know, it's um, it's like is somebody a mathematician when they say two plus two plus five? I mean, for me, you know, any profession, if you want to be able to respect, you want. I'm at a point in time where our profession, the legal profession, is losing respect. Why? Because it's like mathematicians saying two plus two plus five. We know it equals four. But if a mathematician says, you know, if you, if you wanted to go study higher math, learn the complexities and the ability to solve problems and create ideas and so forth, and you're at a master's level or a PhD level, and you go to class and they say, we're going like, to start from the beginning. You've all been taught 2 plus 2 equals 4, but I'm here to tell you 2 plus 2 equals 5, and in some cases it could equal 6. Now you just deconstructed the very fundamental basics of math. So if you do that, how can you, how can you have any trust in anything else that this theory or, or problem solving provides? You can. And what happens when you go to law school? When I was in seminary, for example, I mean, the reason why I learned our theology and all the languages and so forth and the history of the church is you try to learn what that scripture means. You try to put yourself in the context. Now when I go to law school, I'm in a constitutional law class, 
Every law school in the country is the same way, except for Liberty University and Regent University and maybe a few others. And that is, you don't have to read the Constitution. You really don't. We never had to read the Constitution in my time on class. My wife went to her professor after her class one day and she was asking something about the 11th Amendment. She was saying, well, you know, I'm trying to figure out what this means. And the professor says, why are you reading that? It doesn't mean what it says anyway. So when they say they're a constitutional law professor, they're a philosophy professor. Masquerading, using, masquerading words like the Constitution. It, it really is nonsense. Uh, so, every time they would say, well, he was a constitution, he was an adjunct professor. First of all, which is nothing wrong with that. It's just that he wasn't a full flown professor or teacher, but even if he was, you know, um, he, he had no interest in the text of the meaning of the Constitution. And neither do any of the people that he appoints. I've argued before a number of them, and they could act. Let me, let me give you an example, and I don't want to belabor it, but we have, there was a case in Virginia, brand new uh, federal judge that was appointed by. Barack Obama, he's fundamentally transformed the judiciary by appointing so many people that are not just moderate, they're, 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 they're radical in their judicial philosophy. But this woman was appointed in Virginia, and so she wrote an opinion uh, striking down the Virginia Marriage Amendment. And she wrote this opinion. So you, you have someone here that's graduated from law school, right? She knows people are going to read this opinion because it's going to be out there in the media. And she's got law clerks who also have graduated from law school, and they're reading the opinion as well before they release it to the public. You think they get at least this right. She says, we all know that the Constitution says that quote all in our great people, close quote. Ding, ding, ding. The Constitution doesn't say that. That's the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> she didn't know the difference between the two, and neither did her law school graduated law clerks. And she's trying to tell us now that the Constitution says that you can't have the state Constitution amendment on marriage. So, you know, it really becomes very distasteful when you see that. Probably, 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 you want to say anything today? As far as people like the president are concerned, Knowledge is not a First of all, I want to thank both of you. I have to say, each of your speeches were very, very powerful. But together, there was synergism. So in your case, one plus one equals three. <laughs> question I have for both of you, when it comes to voters guides for which candidates are pro-life and not pro-life, is it legal to give it out in a church? Is it legal to give it out in the church's parking lot? And if not, how do we give it to parishioners who are leaving church? I can uh, start on that. Uh, we, we do at Liberty Council, we've done for years review and create uh, candidate guides and we review them for lots of organizations across the country that will, in fact, I've got one on my email right now under the review, and I do a video and I've done lots of speaking and writing on this issue. But it's fairly simple in terms of the voter guide. You can educate about the candidate's positions on the voter guides. And uh, you can, what I do is I recommend a, several different uh, points of Interests that you have on the voter guide could be life, marriage, could be taxes, whatever it might be, or different kinds of areas of life in terms of different legislation. And you um, put it there as to whether you know, they're, they voted, would they be in favor for uh, a human life amendment, or would they be in favor of banning partial birth abortion, you know, yes, no, and so forth. As long as you're doing that in a way that's called objective and you cover uh, a, a variety of subject matters, it's perfectly fine to pass that in the church. In fact, from 1954 to the present, when that was put into the IRS code by then Senator Lyndon Bain Johnson, who was trying to get back at a nonprofit that opposed his election, not a church, it was put into the IRS code with no debate that says you can't, as a nonprofit, 501c3 endorsed or opposed candidate. From that time to the present, not one church has ever lost its tax and status. In fact, the only church that came even so-called close to it was the church of Pierce Street in, in uh, New York. 
The Matrix got full page ads in 1992 in the USA Today and Washington Times newspapers made tens and tens of thousands of dollars for those ads. And they opposed then Governor Bill Clinton for president because of his position on abortion. They listed the church's name and they asked for more contributions so they could run more ads. But Bill Clinton got elected. The IRS came for them. This particular church had voluntarily obtained a tax exempt status letter. Churches are unique in that they don't need a tax exempt status letter. Liberty Council, for example, is not a church. We have a letter. Non churches that seek tax exemption need to get a letter from the IRS. If this was a church, and this was our first meeting tonight, and we started right now, at this moment, we would be tax exempt under the IRS code. We don't need the letter. This particular church voluntarily obtained the letter. So the IRS took it. They sued. And uh, the Federal Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia said that IRS can take the letter, but it's only symbolic, it has no substantive meaning, and the IRS even acknowledged that not one dime that had been contributed to the church uh, was um, not going to be tax exempt. So it never lost its tax exempt status at that point, even when it crossed the line clearly to this day. Not one church in the history of America has ever lost its tax exempt status for opposing or supporting a political candidate for office. And uh, I go into this, this very specific point at great length in the book I mentioned, Abolishing Abortion, because this is something we at Priests for Life have been encouraging churches to do, and we'll encourage them again at this election, uh, to, to use C3 qualified voters guides to inform their parishioners about the positions of the candidates. Now, you know, some voter guides express a preference. Uh, the C3 voter guide simply pre presents the positions. Neutral, no preferences. But the point is that, keep in mind too, as, as Matt mentioned about the Johnson Amendment, that's law saying, well, you don't intervene if you're a tax exempt organization, you don't intervene in a political race. The question is, what does exactly that mean? And the IRS interpretations of that, remember, do not have the force of law. Law is one thing. Interpretation of a bureaucratic agency is something different. And then sometimes what happens is that um, organizations, church bodies, or other groups will then interpret the interpretation of the IRS. And you'll, you'll end up with policies or memos or directives that are several steps removed from what the law actually requires or prohibits. So my counsel on this is, is always been, look, let's just be, let's be very, very uh, reasonable about this, and also let's be very honest. If a particular church body does not want to hand out a voter side, or do voter registration for that matter, or they would get out the vote campaign, which you can do all of those things in a nonpartisan way, the IRS says that, the legal, um, document that comes out from the Office of the General Counsel of the United States Conference of Bishops says that, that yes, you can do A, B, C, these things in a nonpartisan way. But if a particular church organization does not want to do that, okay, we respect your decision, but don't blame the tax guy. Don't say, oh, if we hand on this voter's guy, we're going to get in trouble with the law, or we're going to have our tax exemption revoked. You know what? We respect your decision what you're going to do and what you're going to not do, but don't come up with a false reason for not doing it. Talk with whatever the honest reason is, but you're not breaking the law. I served on a congressional committee that was looking at IRS laws regarding churches, one of which is this issue. And there were three panels, one for nonprofit experts, one for legal, one for a clergy. And uh, I won't mention the clergy, but it was a, it was a high level clergy. Uh, wasn't wasn't the captain, uh, but it was uh, second. Kind of, but there was a lot of people. On the panel, so, um, but he had indicated that he didn't want that particular position revealed, revealed because the consensus was to reveal it. Because it's never been enforced. It's never been uh, effective against churches. He didn't want to reveal it because it was something he could then use as an excuse to tell his congregants why he wasn't going to talk about the issues. Um, so when I talk to pastors, I'll say, look, after 
after what you just heard, if you now no longer, if you still don't want to talk about these issues, don't blame it on the law, because the law is not the reason of why you're assigning on these issues. We've got a free DVD, it's called Silence is Not an Option, it's for pastors and clergy that we'll provide to you. You can go to lc.org and get it. And we also have a little book that has that information here as well. This question is, is germane to the youth. Uh, I work with a lot of youth, and uh, we seem to lose them when they go to college. And you might ask, why? Why do we lose them going to college? I had a very, very intimate experience on why we lose uh, our children when they go to college. It gets diluted. Uh, we, we raise these children with doctrine. We raise them with spirit. We raise them with this. And I wanted to know whether there's any protection. I know some court cases. Uh, are out there uh, with regard to, I, I tried to get a master's program for drug and alcohol. They had a questionnaire on what did I think about abortion, what did I think about transgendering, what did I think about gay adoption, what did I, they just had a list of all these things. And I know there was a court case in Georgia. And, and the reason why I bring this up is because we're facing, the reason why there isn't as many young people is that in the, in the colleges, in these public colleges, it's so difficult to bring your morals and carry them all through because they dilute them and direct them. And, and the reason why we need more of this, and my question is specifically legal, is are there court cases out there trying to protect people like me that were not permitted to go into that? They rejected me. I, I had six different questions. And I said, my brother was gay. And, and, and my experience was my brother was gay, and his partner, who I loved just like I loved my brother, was in my wedding. But my, my brother's partner hung himself in the Indiana hotel. My brother, five years later, Xanaxed himself. The only person I knew was transgendering, shot himself. You know, when you get exposed to all these things, I personally experienced abortion. I know personally how that affects the woman. I know how it affects me. And what I'm saying is that this barrier in our educational system, this dilution of our morals and values, and that non-acceptance to be able to be stepping forward and not supported, unless you went to a Christian college, I guess I'm asking is, is anybody taking up these, these fights? Because I, I, I tried to fight as best as I could. Yeah, I'm going to address the two parts of the question. Uh, on the first part, let me just say something. As part of what we did, what I did at Liberty uh, in my niche, and working also not only at the doctoral level, but with other students at the university, what we're seeing with the millennial generation, left with those born from 1986 after, give or take a few years, um, they are often disconnected with their faith after they graduate from high school and go on to college. They disconnect from institutions, whether it's uh, parties or churches, and they disconnect because they're getting challenged in college and their worldview is not that strong. And uh, because it's either not being developed in their educational system or it's not being developed in their homes, uh, the ones that are accepted out of homeschool students. We could, I could tell first week in class who in my class was homeschooled. It's pretty obvious. Um, but, so they're disconnected. And, um, but they're very uh, influenced by human relationships and they're very cause-oriented as well. So if they know someone oftentimes, I mean in the pro-life arena, they're becoming more pro-life than our generation, which is interesting. In the human sexuality, I mean, they're becoming more uh, liberalized there, of alternative ways of living and lifestyles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it, oftentimes, because they know someone who is a nice person, therefore their worldview is shaped by that relationship. Um, we try to address that uh, at Liberty Council. We have a program where we take uh, Christian college age students to Israel for literally a like a spiritual boot camp for a week for 500 bucks. Um, you have to apply. Uh, you have to be accepted. Uh, we want your Christian testimony. We want your leadership you know, that you've been involved with. We have four more trips this summer. 
We will have had 142 colleges and universities, Christian, private, Ivy League, across the board. It's literally life changing to connect them to the roots of the faith because of the concern of that this generation is dissonant. So that's one of the things that we're doing. You can go to covenantjourney.org for that, because that's also a ministry of liberty council, so covenantjourney.org. If you know a Christian college age student who has leadership potential, this literally is life transformative. Second thing, though, is yeah, there are cases. There are actually two cases dealing with the issue you're talking about, and unfortunately, it went the wrong way. Uh, one is out of Georgia, and one's out of another part of the country. And it was uh, master's counseling students who uh, got expelled because of their opinion on homosexuality. There was a person just within the last week, last couple of days, in fact this week, that was reported in the media, who was uh, pursuing a master's in social work in England, and because he posted on his private, on his Facebook, only available to his friends, not to the public. And someone apparently turned it into the university. Uh, he supported on the Facebook marriage of the man and woman, in specific reference, named Kim Davis, my client. And now he got dismissed from pursuing a master's program because he's considered unfit based on his belief on natural marriage. There are cases on that, the two that are out there have gone the wrong way, unfortunately. Uh, we will litigate those kinds of cases. So we're involved not only in litigating, but crafting legislation that will directly affect those kinds of situations. Because you can go get the education you want in most Christian schools, but a lot of these uh, people are going to the secular schools, and that's where they're getting. You're not going to be able to graduate from a secular school on a master's in counseling or social work without being literally indoctrinated with the whole LGBTQ, et cetera, et cetera, agenda. I mean, it is fraught with that. And uh, it is literally being taken over uh, by that agenda within the academic environment. And you know, this question about youth also, remember in my talk when I mentioned abortion survivor syndrome, we've not begun to be able to understand or calculate what it does for our young people, to their ability to grasp the faith, to their ability to understand love and God and family, when we've told them, you're not a person. We've told them. In the first nine months of your life, you could have been killed and the law didn't protect you. And it's like, what does it, you know, what does it do to the young person at some point in their life to realize, hey, wait a minute, abortion is legal, that means babies in the womb are killed. I used to be a baby in the womb. It was legal when I was, so I could have been killed by mom. And, and you know, this does something to our young people that, again, we're only beginning to understand. And that impacts all of this. And, and, and also, I mean, they're becoming more and more polite. Why? Because they're seeing the pain of abortion in the faces of their friends and their relatives. And they're also speaking up for themselves. Hey, I was a person then, and now, just like I'm a, I was a person then, I should have be been protected. But then, when it comes to things like gay marriage, they, that voice of experience is going the opposite direction. And, you know, they, they see people in these relationships initially. Oh, well, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with my friend who's in that kind of a relationship. And so they get the idea that this is a good thing. But, mark my words, as the years go on, that's going to run up against the same dead end uh, as, as abortion has. You, you, you don't have, no matter how many courts say it's a good thing, eventually you hit the brick wall of human nature. And you suffer from it as a result, as you even mentioned in your question. Small, but see. 
that sometimes they get mad at the justices because they don't think that they're interpreting it according to their intent. He says, but we read a lot of U.S. Supreme Court cases, and just like you did, we look at the penumbra. Well, what's he referring to? You know, he thought he was going to get a resonating response from the group. He didn't realize we were from Liberty University School of Law. And it was like dead silent. And uh, I went back and got on the bus and I said, isn't it a shame how our country has influenced the judiciary of the nation of Israel? The penumbra is the word coming from the road versus way of And also on your question of language, <clears throat> some of you may know the book by Professor William Grant called Dehumanizing the Vulnerable When Word Games Take Lives. Because an, an amazing historical analysis of how oppressed groups in human history, whether we're talking about the Jews, African Americans, women at a certain stage of our own history, etc. Before they are oppressed, they are called names. It's a bully phenomenon of a playground. Uh, call names before you beat up the victim. And, 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 the name, and the similarity of the names is amazing. Parasites, waste, garbage, property, uh, and the same thing. Dehumanizing names being used of the unborn. And then he talks about the language of affirmation, the language of blessing. And this is a change we need to bring about culturally, the way we talk about the baby. Don't talk about even the most committed polite people. You and I hear it all the time. Oh, how many children do you have? I have uh, three and one on the way. On the way from where? <laughs> oh, I'm expecting a child. If you're expecting a package, do the package arrive again? You know, you're not expecting a child. The child's not on the way. The child's already there. So even the way we just talk about these things, you know, you know how many children have? One have four. Three are born and one is in the womb. When do we name the, when do we name the child in the womb? Even if you don't know yet, it's a boy or a girl, we have two names. I, Jim or Joan, you know. But, but to give the baby a name, when the baby begins to be a person, which is when? At the beginning. Now, so these are little cultural shifts. Using the power language, like you say, it does matter. It does matter a very great deal. Praise the Lord. We're going to have to close this part of our, 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 our session right now. Hopefully we'll bring these young, these young men back for a whole day session. And we just don't have the time. Let's give them a great
we bless our actions and move us forward into form of formal action. Formal action. Lord, in the beginning, when you were creating, you created life. And you saw that it was, is, and always will be very good. Help us, Lord, inspired by the words of the Spirit through your people, to know the precious gift of life. Help us, Lord, inspired by the gift of your Spirit through this evening, to celebrate the gift of life. Inspire us, Lord, in the face of opposition, to stand for and witness to the gift of life. Lord, loving God, your gift has been created as your image. Help us, Lord, never to defile it. Help us, Lord, to polish it. Help us, Lord, to respect it. Help us, Lord, to honor it in the same way we honor you. We are your image. Help us, Lord, to act like you. Help us to love. Help us to care. Help us to heal. Help us to help. Lord, loving God, as we have gathered here this evening, we recognize that we are not alone. We are supported. We are supported first and all by you. We are supported by one another as well. Help us, Lord, as we go forth from here, energized once again in our faith and in our commitment. Help us, Lord, to see the work of faith, that the work of faith is a work of hope, and the work of hope is a work of love. May we, who have been birthed by your love, always and everywhere, respect the gift you have created in love, the gift of life. We ask this, because we ask all things, Christ our Lord, 